It's a pretty astounding fact that Professor Tolkien created almost 55,000 years of history between the creation of Arda and the destruction of the One Ring. And yet his fictional chronology is about as clear and compelling as our own mere 5,000 years of real world history. It feels like Tolkien created a million pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And then over the course of his lifetime he put these pieces together and made one vast picture. However, not every piece of this puzzle fits. Peppered throughout the Legendarium there are a small number of enigmas, which add their own unique but utterly mysterious flavour to Tolkien's world. A la Tulia Meldonia, a Haramari essay, my name is Rainbow Dave and welcome to another Tolkien lore video. So in this video I'm going to delve into three of these enigmatic little details and I'll try to ask some of the questions that perhaps Tolkien never intended to answer. Now before we begin I should definitely say that there are more than three enigmas in Tolkien's Legendarium and one of the most famous of these conundrums is Ungoliant, the mother of Shelob. But to be honest I kind of already made a video all about her and if I were to go into great detail on her in this video it would be like hours long. So I'll leave a link to the Ungoliant video below but for now we'll focus primarily on the profoundly mysterious and unknown king called Bladothine, the utterly puzzling nameless things that live beneath Moria and of course the most enigmatic enigma of them all, Tom. Bombadil. So let's begin with King Bladothine, because whether you're like super familiar with the Silmarillion or not, you may very well be thinking, King who? I mean Bladothine is about as far from a household name as one can get and I'd wager he's probably the most mysterious king in the entire legendarium. Because the truth is we know almost nothing about him. Bladothine's only reference can be found in the 12th chapter of The Hobbit, where we are told that among the treasures of Erebor there are spears that were made for the armies of the great king Bladothine, long since dead, but they were never delivered or paid for. Now this may not seem like a particularly big deal, but it raises a good number of questions. Because of course every king needs a kingdom and every kingdom needs a populace and a location and a culture and the truth is when it comes to Bladothine Tolkien gives us none of these. All we get is a name. But Bladothine is a particularly interesting name because although Tolkien never provided any kind of explicit etymology we can be certain that it is an elvish name. And that raises a ton of questions, the first of which being what elven king of the third age purchased his army spears from the dwarves of Erebor? All the elven kings of the Eldar days are accounted for in the Silmarillion and Bladothine certainly isn't one of them. He's also not a king of Mirkwood or Lothlorien because again they are all accounted for. And as far as we're told there are no other elven kingdoms east of the Misty Mountains. Also if Bladothine were an elf then surely his long since death would have been like recorded somewhere. You know elves love to talk about dead elves, it's like their favourite thing to do. However an elven name does not necessarily mean an elven character. And nowhere does Tolkien state that Bladothine is in fact an elf. We could just as easily speculate that he was a man, but this still raises plenty of questions. I guess at first glance the simplest answer might be that Bladothine was a king of Dale. After all we know that Dale and Erebor had a long history of trade, but I don't believe this is the case. The men of Dale speak their own dialect of Rohiric, not Elvish, 
And although it's true that Bard's ancestor Geryon was an exception, as he did indeed have a Sindari name, Geryon was a lord, but not a king. In fact, there is no mention of Dale having any kings before Bard is crowned at the end of The Hobbit. And when Smaug destroyed Dale hundreds of years earlier, it was referred to as a town and lordship, not a kingdom. So, I would have to speculate that Bladothine's realm lies a little further afield than Erebor's doorstep. After all, we know that he wasn't close enough to lend aid when Erebor was sacked. And if we look at a map of Eastern Middle-earth, we may find a clue as to the location of this mysterious kingdom. You see, in the appendices of Return of the King, we're told that the dwarves of Erebor traded with men who lived between the rivers Kelduin and Karnen. Now, these two rivers flow from Erebor and the Iron Hills all the way southeast to the Sea of Rune, which is right on the easternmost outskirts of the map. And on the shores of the Sea of Rune, Tolkien told us of a mysterious land called Dorwenion. Now, what's so interesting about Dorwenion? Well, it too has an elvish name. It's about as far east as the map goes, and it exists in the very un-elven lands of the Easterlings, but just like Bladothine's name, it betrays some degree of elven influence. And furthermore, we know that Dorwenion did trade with the elves of Mirkwood. In fact, Dorwenion is the place that supplied the wine that caused Thranduil's butler to pass out. So we know that in Dorwenion, they make wine strong enough to knock an elf unconscious. Anyway, you may be wondering why a Manish kingdom like Dorwenion would have an elvish name just as you may very well be wondering why a presumably mannish king has an elvish name. But there is one more piece of speculation that might illuminate these questions. Because, as I've already mentioned, elves aren't the only ones who speak an elven language. In fact, the state language, the official language of the Dúnedain, is also Sindarin. Now, the Dúnedain are, of course, the men of the West, so it's only natural to wonder how they could end up so far in the East, but Tolkien does give us another clue here. So, right at the beginning of the Third Age, there was a Gondorian king called Turambar. And we're told that during his reign, King Turambar conquered the lands of the Easterlings and he won new territories for Gondor within the region of Rune. And so, for over 1,000 years, Gondor held these eastern lands, and presumably they would have built Gondorian outposts and cities within their new borders, right? So, could Dorwenion be one of these former Gondorian cities in Rune? Could it have gained political independence when Gondor's borders were later pushed back? Could King Bladothine be a descendant of these Gondorian rulers? The answer is, I don't know. I don't even know what race Bladothine belongs to, but if I had to speculate, I find this the most plausible answer. Whatever conclusions you draw for yourselves, it is pretty cool to imagine that perhaps, once upon a time, there may have been a line of Dúnedain lords who eventually declared themselves kings of this wine-producing realm far in the east. And perhaps Bladothine was just one of them. Now, before we move on, I probably should mention that the most realistic explanation for this name comes from like a totally out-of-universe perspective, because when Tolkien first wrote his earliest drafts for The Hobbit, the character that we now know as Thorin was originally called Gandalf. And the character that we now know as Gandalf was originally called Bladothine. 
So, although it's maybe not as like exciting as speculating on Gondorian kings of the east, I would say that probably the most realistic explanation here is simply that Tolkien liked the name, but he decided it wasn't quite right for his wizard character, so instead of deleting it entirely, I guess he recycled it, and when he needed a name for this mysterious king who bought these dwarven spears, he went back to Bladothin. Although, I guess there's really no reason why this little tidbit about Tolkien's process should undermine our ability to speculate about a figure who totally did make it into the Legendarium. Anyway, that's all I've got on Bladothine, but our second set of enigmas are even more mysterious. And to be honest, there's not a lot that I can say about them. They are simply the nameless things that gnawed the world deep beneath Moria. And almost everything else about them is conjecture. So what do we know? Well, in the Two Towers, when Gandalf the White reveals himself to the Three Hunters, he tells the tale of how the Balrog fled into dark tunnels beneath the Misty Mountains after their fall from the Bridge of Khazad Doom. And Gandalf explicitly states that these tunnels were not made by Durin's folk. Far, far below the deepest delvings of the dwarves, the world is gnawed by nameless things. Even Sauron knows them not. They are older than he. Now, Tolkien never mentioned these nameless things again. Not in his later writings, not in any letters, and not even his son Christopher had any additional details for us. But the fact that they're supposedly older than Sauron is very curious. Because just like all the divine beings, Sauron was created before the universe itself. And so on the one hand, it may seem that nothing could be older than him. And yet apparently, the nameless things are. However, one could, I guess, argue that Sauron's life, and I'm using air quotes there, did not officially begin until after he left the Timeless Halls and entered Aea. But even so, according to Gandalf, by the time that Sauron did that, these nameless things already dwelt beneath the earth. And what makes the age of the nameless things even more curious is the fact that the Misty Mountains are around 33,000 years younger than any other mountain range in Middle-earth. Which means, for a good whack of time, the nameless things gnawed the earth without any mountains above them. Now, I guess the most exciting, or perhaps chilling, theory about these nameless things is that they may have been some sort of early creation of Melkors. Perhaps they were the first monstrous beings of darkness, which were created before Melkor had yet perfected his craft. Perhaps they were such abominations that even Melkor had no hope for them, and he buried them inconceivably deep in the earth before raising the vast misty mountains on top of them, to trap them. There are no facts here, but it's pretty shiver-inducing to think about. Alternatively, perhaps these nameless things aren't creations of Melkor's at all. Perhaps they're something else entirely. I know I said I wasn't going to go into detail about Ungoliant, but in some ways she may be comparable to these nameless things. We are told in the Silmarillion that Ungoliant lived where the shadows were deepest and thickest, secret and unknown. The Eldar knew not when she came. So perhaps she is an example of a potentially nameless thing that ended up getting a name. We just don't know. But then there is the Watcher in the Water. Is that one of the nameless things? We know that the lake that the Watcher lives in was created by the dwarves damming a river, 
So perhaps just as they unleashed the Balrog by delving too deep, maybe they unleashed the Watcher by damming the river and trapping it near the surface. I guess either way, the dwarves do have pretty bad luck when it comes to unleashing primeval monsters of fire and water. But even the assumption that the nameless things are living beings is just that. It's an assumption. Perhaps they aren't creatures at all. Perhaps these tunnels that Gandalf tells us about were simply delved by forces of discord and darkness that were unleashed by Melkor during the first war while Arida was still being made. I mean, I guess that would explain how they're older than Sauron and how he could know them not. I suppose at the end of the day, all that we really know for sure is that the nameless things are an evil presence. And according to Gandalf, simply speaking about them is enough to darken the light of day. However, neither the nameless things nor King Bladothin are the most famous of Tolkien's enigmas, and I couldn't possibly go on with this video without talking about Tom Bombadil. Now, in many ways, Tom is kind of like the complete opposite of the nameless things. He is a being of many names, and he appears to be an entirely positive influence in Middle-earth. But just like the nameless things, there are very few hard facts about him. So among Tom Bombadil's multiple names, there is one constant. The guy is old, like very old. To the Rohirric speaking men, Tom is called Orald, which is an old English word meaning ancient. To the dwarves, Tom is known as Thorn, which is an old Norse name that also pertains to ancient days. And to the Sindarin-speaking elves and the Dúnedain, Tom Bombadil is known as Iarawain Benedar, which literally means old, young, and fatherless. Now, these revealing names immediately imply that Tom Bombadil may be one of the Ainur, as they are the oldest living things in the Legendarium, and technically, as offspring of Iluvatar's thought, they could all be considered fatherless. But I worry that this classification is just too simplistic for such an enigma. And being an Ainu does not even explain Tom's most enigmatic traits. So I guess the absolute simplest theory about Bombadil's origins is that he's a Maya. This explains his age and his power, and it doesn't raise too many follow-up questions as Tolkien never gave us an exhaustive list of all the Maya in the Legendarium. But being a Maya doesn't explain everything. Perhaps the most mysterious aspect of Tom is that the One Ring appears to have no effect on him. He takes it from Frodo, he puts it on his finger, and yet nothing happens. He's not corrupted, he doesn't turn invisible, and to be honest, there's no way that this immunity to corruption is a Maya power. Because, of course, loads of Maya have been corrupted over the ages, including Sauron himself. And we know that Gandalf, who is kind of a Maya, he used to be a Maya, he greatly fears the ring's corruption. Also, if Tom is a Maya, then he wouldn't be the oldest living being in Middle-earth. Various members of the Valar, including Manwe and Ulmo and Aule and, of course, Melkor, all existed in Arda before the Maya were drawn unto them. And so this has led to some theories that Tom, and I guess by extension his wife Goldberry, may in fact be two of the Valar living in Middle-earth in disguise. But I don't believe this is possible. There are only six married couples amongst the Valar, and none of them seem to have anything really in common with Tom and Goldberry. 
Once upon a time, I believed that Tom might be Orame, and Goldberry might be his wife Vana, but this doesn't make sense. Orame is a hunter of evil things, so why then would there be Barrow Whites living right on his doorstep? I've also seen it suggested that Tom and Goldberry might be Aule and Yavana, but again, this theory falls flat. If there's one thing that can be confidently said about Goldberry, it's that she is in some way connected with water and rivers and rain. She is, after all, the daughter of the River Woman, but the only Valar with any watery association is Ulmo, and he's an unmarried male. Now, I have also seen it speculated that instead of being an Ainu, perhaps Tom Bombadil could potentially be Eru Iluvatar himself in corporeal form. But honestly, I don't think this is likely either. I feel it very much cheapens Eru, and in some ways it kind of cheapens Tom. And Tolkien himself agreed. When he was asked about the relationship between Bombadil and God, Tolkien replied, I really do think you are being too serious, besides missing the point. So, having expanded the long list of things that Tom Bombadil is not, I suppose we should also take a look at what Tolkien actually does tell us about this character. So we're told that Tom is the master of wood, water, and hill, and his interactions with Old Man Willow and the Barrow Whites suggest that he does have some significant degree of power within his own realm. However, the nature of this power is never ever stated. And if Tom truly has been living in the woods of Middle-earth since the very beginning, then he would have observed a remarkable diminishing of his realm over the years. At his own council in Rivendell, Elrond explains that there was once a time when a squirrel could carry a nut from tree to tree, from Rivendell to the Great Sea. Which seems to state that Western Middle-earth was once one huge forest. But as we know, by the time of the Third Age, this is no longer the case. And so, if Tom Bombadil really is the master of wood, then by the time of the Lord of the Rings, most of his realm has vanished. Does that mean his power is diminished too? And before we can even begin to answer that question, we first need to examine how much power does Tom actually have? Because when I first read The Fellowship of the Ring, I imagined that Tom Bombadil must be some sort of all-powerful being, right? If he's able to resist the power of the ring. I guess I assumed for this reason that he was more powerful than even Sauron, but I no longer think this is true. Although it is very compelling to imagine Tom as having godlike powers and being the most powerful character in the story, I don't believe that that is what Tolkien intended. When Tom put the ring on his finger, I don't think he was outmatching Sauron's power, I think he simply lacked the traits of ambition and possessive desire that the ring targets in its victims. Again, in the Council of Elrond, Gandalf argues against an elf called Erestor, who suggested that Tom Bombadil has a power over the ring. But to the contrary, Gandalf said, I should not put it so. Say rather that the ring has no power over him. He is his own master, but he cannot alter the ring itself, nor break its power over others. And later, Gandalf goes on to say, Could that power be defied by Bombadil alone? I think not. I think that in the end, if all else is conquered, Bombadil will fall. The power to defy our enemy is not in him. And furthermore, in letter 144, Tolkien himself wrote, Ultimately, only the victory of the West will allow Bombadil to continue, or even to survive. Nothing would be left for him in the world of Sauron. 
So, all of this suggests that although Tom does have significant power in his little corner of the world, he is not the all-powerful being that we sometimes imagine him to be. But the question still remains, why does Tom Bombadil even exist? I suppose an out-of-universe answer might be simply that Tolkien liked the name. His son Michael supposedly had a Dutch doll that was called Tom Bombadil. And so perhaps Tom is simply just a cameo for his son, or maybe a relic left over from the children's story that he originally intended to write. However, from a more in-universe perspective, I think that the answer's a little bit more complex. Tom seems to represent a personification of peace and pacifism. And so perhaps he was created for this very purpose by Eru Iluvatar way back in the beginning. Peace and natural woodland are things that Tolkien himself valued very, very highly. And so perhaps he wrote Tom to embody these virtues. However, it's interesting to note that although both Gandalf and Elrond agree that Tom is a benevolent being, they both know that his pacifism alone will not be enough to prevent the spread of evil. Although the world needs pacifists like Tom, it also needs people like Frodo and Aragorn and Sam who are willing to go the distance and to see things through to their end. In 20th century Europe, a century marked by generations of war, this may have been a topical theme for someone like Tolkien. After all, he detested violence, and yet he was no pacifist. So, I guess in conclusion, it might feel like a little bit of a disappointment for me to end this video with a statement, I don't know, but I'm afraid that is the bottom line. In letter 174, Tolkien himself wrote, As a story, I think it is good that there should be a lot of things unexplained. And even in a mythical age, there must be some enigmas, as there always are. So, at the end of the day, I feel like Tolkien added these enigmas to his legendarium on purpose. Because not every facet of Middle-earth should be explained. There will always be mysteries, and we need to make peace with that. I believe it's what Tolkien intended. Anyway, there you go, there's some information on some of the more enigmatic elements of Tolkien's Legendarium, and I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, there are plenty more like it on the channel, so check them out. But as always, my dear friends, until next time, much love. Stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine.